Welcome to The Green Room, the podcast that bridges the gap between church production and every other aspect of a worship service. From programming directors to worship leaders, volunteers to vendors, tune in for inspiring conversations, expert advice, and a unique look into the intricate puzzle of church production. Here's your host, Aaron Freeman. Hey, Abigail. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, you are a worship leader by trade, and I know you have a few other things that you're doing, but I would uh, love for you just to tell us a little bit more about yourself. And we, you know. Yeah, thanks for having me, go. Aaron. Uh, I am so excited to be here. Yeah, I have been leading worship for over 15 years, maybe 16, maybe 18. I, it's, you know... <laughs> time eludes me, but I've been leading worship for a long time. I started like probably many people did when I was in the high school band. And I had a good friend mm -hmm. of mine, Rollin Williamson, who kind of really fanned the flame of the worship leading career okay. for me. And um, I've been leading at North Point, um, which is how you and I know each other, mm -hmm. obviously, right. for about right. 13 years, 13 or 14, maybe coming oh, up wow. on 14. Yeah. So so for a long time, um, as a job, for a long time as a volunteer, you know, I'm a Baptist mm -hmm. pastor's kid, so sure. I kind of grew up <laughs> yeah. making the church services happen with my family, um, but it became a, a quote unquote job about 14 mm. years ago. Mm -hmm. Okay, very cool. Yeah, we we met like seven years ago now. Um, you, a worship leader, me, new into the level of production that North Point is, mm. um, and I would really love to just dive into sort of like how has been your experience on stage with mm -hmm. so much so many people uh like people like me uh like our some of our service programming directors scrutinizing mm -hmm. like every little thing that you do and has <laughs> has there been you know ebbs and flows of that yes are we in an ebb are we in a flow like how, how's that experience for you right now that's such a fun question, Aaron. It's a great question, in my opinion, because, yeah, it is hard. It has been hard at times feeling um, like as a worship leader, I've been under a microscope um, mm -hmm. and sometimes a microscope with a scalpel behind it. You know, <laughs> and uh, when I first started singing at, at North Point, it was something I really wanted to do because I really admired the quality of the production, not for mm -hmm. the sake of the production itself, but because mm -hmm. I felt that it was a non-distracting environment where people could come to church and pray and sing and encounter God without feeling uncomfortable mm -hmm. or maybe, you know, oh, if the transitions are bad, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm feeling awkward when I show up to an event and oh, transitions yeah. are bad or, you know, oh, yeah. if it's not, everybody messes up sometimes. I myself sure. mess yeah. up every time I walk on the stage, but I was really drawn to North Point's level of dedication to excellence for the sake of reaching the unbeliever or the unchurched mm. person, okay. as well as the person who is. So I understood coming into it that the high level of excellence was not to harm me, but mm. to protect something in the service and to help elevate my work. It did come with a mm. set of challenges. You know, back when I started leading at North Point, some of us who lead around there will giggle about this. We used to record rehearsal, which we still do, but we right. would have to wait at the end um, because it would be burned on a CD. <laughs> so oh, the wow. rehearsal would be burned on a CD <laughs> and we would drive home and put that CD into our CD player uh -huh. in the car yep. and yep. listen back. And um, what a lot of people who don't sing on stage, maybe with in-ear monitors or with the opportunity to hear a playback that's unedited, is that you mm. you might be a solid singer who has great pitch, but there are times where you think you hear something that you don't hear. And sometimes when you get that CD, you're like, wow, I was really pitchy in that section mm. and I have no idea how that happened. And for me, a lot of the microscope involved being willing to listen to myself in a very microscopic level. You know, the house okay. um, where the congregation or the audience is sitting, whatever yeah. word you want to use, where they're sitting, it's much more forgiving. You've got very, a lot yes. of great, beautiful things happening from these professional sound mixers. But back when we were getting sent home with these CDs, there was <laughs> no tampering, no help, mm -hmm. no reverb, nothing. Yeah, so you're super just dry, hearing. straight to a CD. Yeah, <laughs> That's mm -hmm. right. So yeah. you're just hearing you and yourself out there. And it was very humbling. It was humbling. Mm, okay. um, but it was a good experience because it helped me to grow as a worship leader because I became more dedicated to understanding what my craft was and how to hone that stuff in. Hmm. I will say I had a, 
Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no. I, I was just going to say, how how have you figured out the the balance between listening to that dry mix sounding? I mean, I would imagine it's very vulnerable. Oh, very. I mean, you know, I would call it trash, it. Aaron. I when I listen to it, I call it trash. Like <laughs> um, nobody's harder on anybody themselves than themselves. So you're listening to that dry mix. And then where's that balance between that dry mix and then what you know that the audience is going to experience? Because it's two very different things. Yeah. So do you do you really scrutinize that dry mix to death? Mm. Or do you give yourself grace? Or is that a learning process? Do you have to learn to give yourself grace? That that's a great question. I'm assuming for every worship leader, there's a different path, but for me. Mm. It was Mm. kind of all of those things. I've had seasons where I've been like, I'm trash. This is terrible. I can't believe anybody would pay me to do this. Then I've had seasons where I'm like, I'm going to put this to the side. I'm actually not going to listen to the playback. There was a season where I Mm. refused to listen to playback, Mm -hmm. not because I was trying in any way to be unprofessional, but I knew it was distracting me to the point where I'm overly hyper-focused on this. And now I'm in my head so much that Mm -hmm. I I was becoming paralyzed. And so Mm. I took a season off from listening listening. Then I started listening again and started being gentler with myself, kinder to myself, because during that time, the people on the other side of me in the room, the SPD directors production, they were giving me feedback that said, wow, that sounds great. It feels full Mm -hmm. in the house. So I was thankfully hearing other people who were out in the house who were contradicting the dry mix that I heard. And the great Mm -hmm. news is I know, you know, what I'm hearing in my in-ears is not the same as what I was hearing on that CD. You know what I mean? So the yeah, good yeah. news yes. is yes. that what I was hearing in my ears live was at least still a loving and <laughs> forgiving <laughs> mix because I made it with the monitor person, right. you know, right, like right, I curated right, right. it to my to yeah. my hopes and dreams. Right. So thankfully, that also helps. Um, okay. But there are, are just times where I've had to to put that to the side. There were mm. times where it, was oppressive to me to listen to playback and time Mm. where it was helpful. And what my experience was that working through that self-doubt and even honestly, for me at times, shame, because as a performer, sometimes for me, it's hard not to equate my performance with if I'm a worthy person or not. You know, sometimes I feel ashamed if I feel like I didn't do a good job. Yeah. But through that journey of, okay, I'm listening, this is awful, to, okay, I'm not going to listen, I'm going to be myself, to, okay, Mm. now I'm more comfortable with who I am. I've had helpful feedback from the people on the other side of me. I'm going to take a listen again, and I'm going to just continue to hone. And I would just hone in on it perhaps during the week. And then I would put it to the side and say, Hmm. okay, I'm going to fix my breath support here. I'm going to focus here. I'm going to turn the keys up. So Hmm. I tend to take my pitch reference off of the keys. Growing up, it was the acoustic guitar for me, but now it's it's the keys for me because Hmm. acoustics, as we know, can get out of tune. That keyboard ain't going nowhere. So so if I need to crank it up, now I use it as helpful feedback. What used to feel like Mm -hmm. a condemnation now for me is just information. It no longer dictates to me my worth. I know that I'm not a perfect singer. I know I do a great job. Mm -hmm. I know now from hearing the most famous singers in the world, if you can hear their mixes sometimes, Mm -hmm. you know, what they're hearing in their in-ears. Right, right, right. It also sounds like trash nine (laughs) times out of 10. So that took a lot of pressure off my shoulder as more information was being shared um, about that. So, yeah, that's awesome. That's, uh, that's super helpful. And, and I know that, you know, production guys do the same thing. Like you miss a, you miss a cue or whatever. You're like, I'm so bad at running lights. Right. I'm terrible. And it's like, you, you missed a You missed a downbeat. It's fine. There's going to be another one coming up. That's right. Just get on the next uh, just, one. <laughs> yeah, just, just get on to the next one. That's right. Um, one thing that I find interesting uh, from sitting back and watching, because that mostly is my job. If everything mm. is 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 running smoothly, I'm right. very much an observer in the control rooms. And so I like it when I'm an observer. Of course. Um, yeah, that's course, a good day. Right. right. <laughs> and, and, and also being involved in all the programming meetings and stuff like that, and then mm-hmm. feedback meetings and stuff like that. I know that there's been major conversations on like prayer moments mm-hmm. and wrapping up a, a worship set or yeah. starting a worship set. Hey, are we going to, are we going to welcome the crowd in these first uh, four bars of the song? Um, he did it great, but she didn't. Right. Like, how it's getting that kind of feedback and are are there better ways to do it than maybe you've received? You know, I've received from several different 
campuses different types of feedback. You know, every campus, mm -hmm. as we know, has their own SPD director and there are right. different people who give feedback. And some people are better at giving helpful feedback mm -hmm. and some people it comes out as a criticism. So for me, there's also been a journey with that. You know, okay. at, at first getting those notes felt like death because I was afraid I was going to lose my job. Now, I oh, want to be clear. I want to be clear. Nobody was telling me if you don't do this perfectly, you will lose your job. And in fact, sure. I worked with some of the most wonderful, gracious, generous people on the planet. I mean, truly, mm -hmm. I did. I was just so afraid because the quality of excellence was so high. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. The level of excellence was so high that I was afraid if I wasn't perfect every time, mm -hmm. they might realize that, uh-oh, she's just a fraud. You know, I mm -hmm. definitely think mm -hmm. most performers, not all, but many of us suffer from that imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. And so I never mm -hmm. felt like I belonged anyway. I kept thinking they're going to figure out any day now oh, that I am absolutely terrible at this no. and they're not going to no. call me back. It makes me laugh now yeah. in a healthy way. But I mean, this was a very real fear for many sure. years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Once again, I was surrounded by loving people, but that's just kind of sometimes the nature of working in a high excellence environment mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. that we all want to, you know, we all want to live up to it. Sure. So the feedback can be challenging. You know, I I started when women did not give as much feedback on stage or or okay. I should say setups. Right. We didn't set up as much. We didn't set up the moments quite as much as men did. Usually there were two males and one female. Mm. Or one male and two females, but we weren't going to okay. have as many songs to lead. We didn't necessarily have my experience mm -hmm. as many vision moments or, you know, prayer wrap ups. I felt like I was given way more opportunity than I ever had been in the past, okay. right. but it still wasn't to me what it is now. Now I could be on stage with just female leads. That never happened for me 12, mm. 13 years ago. That wasn't a okay. thing. So sometimes my experience was that I would notice that men were given more opportunities to mess up than women. And I don't think that was oh, intentional. I do not. I want to very okay. clearly say yeah, that. that was but my I, next question. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I really think it was just one of those. Here's the thing, Aaron. We had boundaries, right? So like most of the leadership in the campus at the campuses that I were at were male leaders. So they could take the other male worship leaders to lunch or mm -hmm. to coffee and they're mentoring right. them and they're walking right. them through. Here's how you think through a setup. Here's how you think mm. through this vision moment. And they're yeah. giving them all this private coaching that is appropriate from male to male. But mm -hmm. like I am a single female, you know, and I'm mm -hmm. coming in and there's mm -hmm. all these married men around and we could get together at the church or in certain environments, but there was just what felt like a lot of barriers to getting helpful coaching. And for a while, mm. it was it was just tricky because we didn't have a lot of women who were who were giving us coaching on things like that specifically, like setting mm. up a vision moment. So for me, and again, this is just my experience. I'm not speaking okay. for everyone. Other people may have had a very different experience. Okay. But my experience was that I was terrified when I was given those moments because I thought, I really hope I don't screw this up because they may not ask me again for a long time. And that mm. was my experience. If I did something and it was shaky or rocky, right. I probably was not going to get asked again <laughs> for six months to maybe even a year. Wow. Okay. And nerves, you know, not many people perform at their best under pressure. Some do. Mm -hmm. Not many sure. do. And so, you know, often I would see that it wasn't that people weren't capable of doing well. It was just... We needed more, more reps. We needed to put in more reps. And okay. so right. that feedback that you were asking about in your original question of, okay, maybe this person did it well, but maybe not this person. And how does mm -hmm. that feel? It was tricky at times. Sometimes mm -hmm. it felt a little bit like, you know, walking on eggshells and trying to figure it out. And everybody yeah. was trying to root for everybody. I really feel like okay. we were all being given opportunity, but some of it just by the nature of the demographic back then was just going to naturally lean in one way. Whereas now, sure. like I said, there are women everywhere where oh, I yeah. work. And most of my feedback is from women these days. And I, okay. you know, yeah. so, I mean, it's a little different than when I started 14 years ago. Yeah, that's interesting. I never really thought about that, but yeah, you're right. I know uh, you and I know at North Point, people probably listen to this probably aren't familiar with North Point. Do you, I mean, do you find that when you're at another church, do you find that to be the, to be very similar in that in that getting feedback or getting those prayer moments or um, things like that? Or is it because, I mean, North Point does things very specifically because of right. how we decided to do church, but mm -hmm. other churches are more willing to have a longer prayer 
or sure, a long, right. longer vision and mm. stuff like that. Um, yeah. do, you, do you find that to be the case? Yeah, that's a great question because something people who may not be in the the circle of North Point may not know is that mm-hmm. most of our setups and prayers and stuff do have a clock. Now, there was a mm-hmm. time where it was like, you literally have one minute and 10 seconds. Do oh, not yeah. go a second over. And I used to, baby, write them down, <laughs> practice it out. I mean, I had that sucker memorized. Uh-huh. I was terrified. And I want to say I was very encouraged when those I remember Todd Fields used to work there and Todd encouraged me a lot. I've had a lot of I I realized that what I said earlier may sound like it was male to female negative, but I had a lot of male Mm. encouragement. It's just that I wasn't able to get in the same reps of coaching. Right. If that makes sense. Uh, Yeah. As many times. Clarify that. Yeah. Right. 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 That's really it. Um, But I had a lot of encouragers like Todd Fields or Eddie Kirkland Mm -hmm. or Reed Mm -hmm. Grevin. I mean, all of these people who were telling me you can do it, but it was like little snippets here and there instead of sitting down and working through the process. So those time clocks and stuff were terrifying to me. Oh, yeah. uh, But I was I am a performer. I'm also an actor and, you know, a speaker. And so for Mm -hmm. me, that wasn't too, too foreign, whereas I have a lot of other musician friends who that was a very foreign idea. So the idea of, Mm. you know, wrapping all of this up felt fine putting a bow on it was fine, but now 70 seconds. I don't know about that. That was mm-hmm. challenging. Yeah. So, you know, my experience was largely at North Point because that's mostly where I am. I've been there at North Point or a surrounding campus almost every single Sunday for the last, you know, 13, 14 mm-hmm. years. Now, when yeah. I've gone to other churches around, I've had really great experiences, but most of them have been very similar to how North Point is run. Some of them are okay. more lenient, which is great. I love going somewhere where they're like, you do you, you know, like, great. <laughs> I got eight days. I usually don't take it all eight days, but it can feel nice to do that. But I appreciate what North Point is trying to do. And I don't have a problem yeah. with it, if that makes sense. My sure. attitude yeah. in the yeah. approach was you serve the place that you're at. So when I'm at North yeah. Point and the leadership and the vision that I know is crafted, I've said yes to. And mm-hmm. so they're asking me to do this task. And so I would approach it with I said yes to this. I agreed to it. So I'm going to come under and support their vision. This Mm. is not the Abigail show. It's not Abigail's vision. Mm. And so how do I say, if I feel like God's put something on my heart to say, what I need to say in a way that's honoring to the place that's asked me. And on a rare occasion, Mm. I have felt very rare. I have felt like it's not possible in these parameters for me to say what I feel Mm -hmm. you know, move to say, so I'm actually just going to ask, Hey, could somebody else Mm -hmm. do it? That's pretty rare for me that that happens, but it has happened a couple of times where I just knew what I have to say won't fit this moment Mm -hmm. and your needs. And so I'm going to pause and give this, you know, prompt at a different place at a different time. But usually it comes that I can pray through those moments and think, okay, God, what are you putting on my heart? And how do I craft this in a way that's honoring to the place that has asked me to do this moment? And, Mm -hmm. um, for me, that's the dance I'm working with, you know. Interesting. That's awesome. Uh, I'd love to take a little bit of a turn uh, towards a little bit of production. Uh, totally. I would love to hear your feedback on like, I don't know, monitor engineers or your front of house. Like those are the two guys that you got, you work with the most mm. nice monitor guys or girls. Sure. Um, no, yes. Yes, yeah. that's right. Obviously, I'm sure you've had some good ones, some bad ones and some great mm. ones like yeah. what's the what's the difference between like the good and great mm. um and then like i, I mean if you want to throw them under the bus you can say names <laughs> i would say no names i would never do that that would <laughs> never like, what, do that number one what what's a like what's a what's good example of, of like a, maybe an incident where like they didn't know that it was like ooh maybe you shouldn't do that sure i actually have one that comes right off the bat i'll start by saying this the monitor engineers that I work with right now are all fantastic. My experience cool. now, I will say That's that. Cool. And I can say that truthfully. I have built and they have built with me a relationship over years of work where mm. we know each other. Now, some are more naturally going to be able to give me a mix that I'm looking for right away because they know me. Okay. Some people are just my experience with some monitor engineers is there. It's intuitive for them. They just walk in. They feel it. They kind of know mm. from a couple of the things that you say what you're going to look for and they can really? just nail it. Oh yeah. Like, like what, what kind of stuff? So like, there's one, I'll say a name, AJ, AJ. <laughs> I call um, him FJ yes. as a joke. AJ and I know each other well, and he knows yeah. what kind of mix I like. 
So okay. I usually don't have to give AJ any notes because the really? second he turns my mix on, he takes a listen and he'll say, oh, she's going to want. Oh, yeah. And he will literally start mixing. Mm. It's very rare that I have a comment for AJ. We know yeah. each other. He, again, he knows what type of mix. I like Terry mm -hmm. up at Brown's Bridge. Shout out, Terry <laughs> is another one of those people who he just knows what kind of mix okay. I like. And he tends to just mix for it. He's just very intuitive. And how long how long has that taken? I mean, like with AJ, it did not take very long. I don't think it took very long with Terry either. But, you know, the time I've known them all for years now. I just mm -hmm. don't know. I, yeah. I can't remember, but I wanted to start with a very positive thing that I have a lot okay. of wonderful. I could literally name everyone. Now I feel like I need to name <laughs> every engineer who's, you know, mixed for me. And I'm so grateful for what they do because they set me free to mm. lead worship. Do you know what I'm saying? Like without yeah, them, yeah. I'm distracted and I'm frustrated and I can't mm. get it. You know, that yeah. is not how I want to spend my time that I feel like God has given me to help lead mm. his people that day. And they are helping lead me by helping me be free and they're also sure. helping ladies people so i'm thankful for how we all work together a negative experience i had was way back in the day when i first started leading at north point and some of this has to do with just being new and shy but mm. there used to be some monitor engineers and they don't they're not around anymore who would ignore my requests so if i would say hey i need more click and they would take a listen and they'd say oh, okay but nothing would change and I would feel a little embarrassed, like, oh, maybe I'm, maybe, hmm. maybe they gave me the change and I just didn't notice it. So I'd raise my hand again and say, hey, I, could I have some more click? And, yeah. um, and then nothing would change. And I'd, I'd be embarrassed because you don't want to ask too many times right. when you're the new right. one, you know, that right. and now right. I don't right. care because right. I'm too old to care. But like back then, I'm, <laughs> you know, 20 and terrified. And they wouldn't change things on my mix. And I started asking around to a couple other, other people and, we had similar experiences where they would tell me they had changed something, but nothing would change. And then other mm. people would ask and things would change and it would depend on who asked them. And the attitude behind that was, I know better than you do. You just don't know what you're asking was the attitude that I was met really? with. Really? That would really bother me. That was not often, sure. but there were two or three people that I worked with initially mm. that were like that. And it was very insulting, especially the older I got and the mm -hmm. more mature I became in it because I yeah. finally just sat there and be like, I need more. I need more. It's not changing for me. Hey, I'm so sorry. It's not changing for me. And that's when we finally started seeing some results. Mm. And I said, if you've changed it, it was not clear at all for me. So I think I'm just going to need a whopping change. And then we yeah. can just go down from there. You know, some of that was um, just communication, but some of it was an arrogance. And you, you mm. know it when you're experiencing it. Uh, but it would just be this whole attitude of, I know better than you. Sometimes I would get my mix locked in and then while I was leading, they would change it. And I would go over and ask, um, my mix just feels different. Did anything change? Well, I was just tweaking it because I figured you might want X, Y, Z. And that would be very bothersome for me because sure. if yeah. I've asked you to tweak it and sometimes I will, that is wildly helpful. Yeah. But if we've spent all this time locking it in and you're making major changes, it just feels very disrespectful to me. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't know what, qualifies me as having great taste in my ear, right. in ears, right. <laughs> but this is what I need. <laughs> yeah. Like, I know I'm not here for taste. I'm sure your ear is better than mine. Right. I just need more of this and right. less of this. <laughs> yeah. You're not, you're not looking for a CD mix in your ears. I'm not. Yeah, you are no. asking for very specific things to help you do what you need to do. That's right. Now yeah. in monitor people's defense, sometimes we don't know what we need. Sometimes I'm hearing a lot of treble, mm -hmm. like a lot of high pitched mm -hmm. sounds and mm -hmm. I'm not, and it just yeah. feels like noise to me. And I might say, Hey, maybe I need less electric. Maybe I need more of this, but all of a sudden I'm making it messier. In that case, I'll say, Hey, I am mm -hmm. making a mess of this. Would you take a listen to this? Here's my big problem. Yep. It's yep. noise. I don't know what to do. Can you fix it? You know, you have a great monitor engineer when they go, let me work on that for you. And then yeah, yeah, they yeah. fix it. So I'm not saying that's never appropriate. It absolutely is. But you but, asked them. But I asked yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, that's you right. Asked them. Yeah. yeah. Every, that's monitor en every monitor engineer that I know will go back to your mix and maybe enhance it. And so I'm not saying that that's but like maybe mm -hmm. opening it up with a little bit more effects here and there that they couldn't mm -hmm. do in the quick turnaround. But I'm, again, talking about major changes. You know, sure. don't do that. Sure. Don't do yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's interesting. So like when you, when we first started the conversation, the thing that stuck out to me was the, the relationship bit. Mm, yeah. Like you have a relationship with AJ, you have a relationship with Terry, yeah, Pat, Terry. all of these people. Yeah, that's right. right. How important is that to you 
like your um, reservations just go away when you walk in and you see AJ at the oh, yeah. console or Terry there. You're just like, yes. all right, I'm good. We're, yes, we're I am. Yes, yeah. a resounding yes. Okay. But I will say this. It is very problematic to me when you have musicians who do not respect the time and the effort that your monitor person is putting mm-hmm. into giving you a good mix. You know, sometimes mm-hmm. there is this yeah. unspoken like, well, that's the band. That's the quote unquote talent. But if you've ever witnessed yeah. anything that is production, all the grunt work is happening in production. Mm-hmm. They are doing all of this hard backbreaking stuff to get you somewhere. So to not work to have a good relationship with them or to treat mm. them with disrespect or as if they're somehow less than is to me the height of unprofessionalism and the height of disrespect. You know, mm. I am thinking they are better than me. Not that it has to be like that, but like I'm thinking you guys are where it's at because without you, I can't be, like I said, undistracted Mm -hmm. on stage. And so I think it's important for there to be that relationship from the musician side as well as the monitor side. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to be a safe space for them. I don't want to be somebody that makes them feel embarrassed or called out. You know, it's people sometimes forget that when people are doing monitors for you and and you keep asking them to fix something on your mix, you know, that can be a little bit uncomfortable because they want to get it right for you. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like they're trying yeah, to get absolutely. it right for you. And so if they feel like they can't win or that you're mad at them or impatient, oh man, mm-hmm. that's really, that's really going to be a challenge to get what you want yeah. and what you both need, What you both, you both want is for you to have a mix that's successful. Right. right? And so, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think that relationship is important, but it's, it's very important that musicians approach it with gratitude and humility because there's mm-hmm. a lot that goes in to crafting these mixes a lot more than we know. So Mm. I just think that's vital. Yeah. The relationship part, I think it would, would, can go a long way with it. Cause there's a, there's always sort of a certain rift as I feel like a too big of a word, but just Mm. maybe just a tension Mm. sometimes between band and production. production. Mm -hmm. Um, And I, and I know in, in my experiences, that also has an ebb and flow. I think it also mm. depends on where you are, the environment that you are, that you're mm. in, excuse me. Yeah. Can you s- speak on that sort of tension and yeah. like if it's some, some places that you've seen it really well and then how to maybe get it there if mm. we're experiencing some major tensions between the band and production? Because then if you are experiencing that major tension, there's you're there's not going to be that relationship there's not going to be that you know um linking arms and going Mm. into the church service together and and Mm. just putting on an amazing worship service service. yeah yeah Yeah, i i would say when and i've seen it happen many times you know traveling and singing at conferences and things like that Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i'm happy to say that the bands that i've traveled with we have tended to have very very beautiful, close, good friendships with our production team. Like we're going out to eat afterwards if we're traveling, you know, we're going together. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I've seen bands come in and just have a very rough relationship with the production, treating them, you know, almost as if they were servants or like, Mm -hmm. you guys are here to serve me. And production people, rightly so, don't tend to like that treatment. Now I've seen people go above and beyond. Yeah, right. Because I wouldn't like it either. Like nobody deserves that kind of treatment, especially when your production people had a a 2am load in. Mm -hmm. And they've been there for all the hours and you just walked in with your, you know, really off brand, but super epically expensive (laughs) coffee. And, you know, you've been sleeping at the hotel with that beachfront, whatever. They Uh don't want to hear that trash. It's very rude. And it does cause problems. You know, your sound checks can go longer. You know, Mm. it just makes everything more frustrating. And then you're not if this is if we're talking about a worship experience Mm -hmm. and you've got all this tension. Yeah. how, How do you approach a healthy God honoring service with that kind of treatment. You know, if you've got this tension, that's you're coming into it with this negative, whatever, not that Mm -hmm. we can't go to God with negativity. I mean, gosh, I do it every day, but like the hope is that you're approaching it with a pure heart saying, God, you know, what, what, if I'm leading somebody, what Mm -hmm. do you want from me with these people? How can I serve you? How can I serve these people? So Mm -hmm. if you have all of this tension, man, it's just, we're missing the point. I mean, if we can't Mm -hmm. love the people around us, then what's this really about? You know, is this about numbers of 
adoring fans, which is why I sometimes I'm uncomfortable using the word audience mm. because, but congregation yeah. feels real Baptist <laughs> right. of me, you know, growing up as a pastor's kid, but yes. I don't know what the right word is. I definitely don't want it to be spectators, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, no. I, 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 I feel the same way. I'm like, we, cause, cause you know, uh, non-denominational, whatever, right. like North point, right. it, it's not, it, it is a congregation, but, but we don't refer right. to it. Right. But we wouldn't say that it could be attendees, whatever. Yeah. But, but yeah. the point yeah. is our relationship with our production people does, in my opinion, reflect a lot about us and our posture coming mm-hmm. in. Now we mm-hmm. approach worship services, all of us, probably for lots of reasons. I need this job. I like what I do. Mm-hmm. I like the people I'm working with. Sure. I want to honor and serve God. I am not asserting in any way that those things are bad things, you know, but but the heart I think of it is that we're doing ministry and we should be here to serve other people. And if we're treating mm-hmm. the people that are helping us along the way like trash, then I'm really just wondering what's the posture of our heart there. And is that mm-hmm. honoring to God? And obviously the answer is no, you know, mm-hmm. and, and I, I, on the flip side, I've worked with some production people that no matter how nice everybody in the band was, they were just sure. in a bad mood and being rude as crap and just right. like, wouldn't give us the changes we asked for. And it was just like, what do you want from yeah. me? Like, I understand that these tensions can come from both sides, yeah. but I think if you make it a point to be overly gracious and grateful with the people you're working with, that goes a very long way. So I, this, a practice that I have is like, I don't ever want to leave soundcheck without thanking the person who Mm. did my mix or going up Mm -hmm. to them after I come off stage and saying, Hey, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. My mix sounds great. Now, if my mix doesn't sound great, maybe I have a couple tweaks and then it's, Hey, thank you so much. But at the end of the day, it's always, thank you so much for what you did. I could not have done what I just did if you had not been in my corner. You know, mm-hmm. it's like somebody in a wrestling ring and then the guy behind him. Like, I feel like yeah. it's like we did this together. Right. You know right. what I mean? Absolutely. Like, that's how yeah. it should be. Yeah. Well, and and I would say the, the inverse to that, in my experience, is that when a worship leader or a musician on stage is just off stage, not a very nice or person. Yeah. It very much reflects my ability to engage with what they're doing on stage. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. And I started noticing that when I was in college, because, mm-hmm. you know, I went to the Christian university and there's any number of the guys in the quad playing the acoustic guitar. Yep. And then you see them in class and they're just like complete jerks. Yes. And then, you know, at chapel or whatever, they're on stage leading worship and you're just like, and they get seem out, like they're trying to come it. across as so, yes. yeah, they're, they're like, I'm oh, I'm like, so sincere. And you're like, mm-mm. no, you're not. You're not mm-mm. sincere. Yeah. You are a complete tool bag. <laughs> and, and that's me seeing it. And so I know that, you know, other people in the school or other people in the congregation have also experienced that. So now you're affecting all of those people's ability to engage in, uh, in the worship service. Yeah. That's um, right. It's tough. Um, and you guys, you know, worship leaders, it's a, a very hard job. And so is, and playing. so is production. And so, yeah, well, yeah, yes. Um, <laughs> I might assert that production <laughs> has some things about it that may be more difficult, though that's not to demean my craft because it does take a lot to do what we do, but we're all working a craft here. And that's what I think yes, is important to absolutely. realize is that it's all a craft. Some mm-hmm. are going to be on the stage, but it's just like, I think what we're seeing in the film industry right now, you know, there are people who are working on set hours and hours and hours getting barely any recognition for all of the work mm-hmm. that they put in. Mm-hmm. And this movie could not happen without it. And yeah. we're just starting to finally come up and say, Hey, it's not just the people on camera who are making mm-hmm. this film. In fact, it is largely and mostly yeah. in part to the production people who are setting up the lighting, who are tweaking mm-hmm. the sound, who are constantly committed to getting the right shots. Yeah, I feel that a live production is the same. We all are doing this job. Some mm-hmm. of us will be the face of it. Some of us will be the brain of it. Some of us will be the heart of it. Mm-hmm. And and I think that it, we have to approach it as a wholehearted process or we lose, I think, some of our long-term influence with the congregation, oh, the abs- attendee, yeah. whatever, Absolutely. to your point. Yes. They see through it, and that's not mm-hmm. why they're here. You know, yeah. we're here to engage with God. <laughs> so, right. yeah. like, let's let's keep the heart of it what it is. That's that's fantastic. I love that. Um, 
I'm trying to think of other. Um... I was going to say, I know I talk a lot, Aaron. So if you're no, like, okay, you're, this episode is wildly long good. enough, like you can cut me off no, whenever. No. I'm just, I'm like, <laughs> I'm just trying to think of like other things that we would talk about, you know, Sure. Um, yeah. as far as yeah. like worship leading and, and um, you know, how that intersects in, in production, the production world or yeah. just the service programming world yeah. um, that we're both intimately involved in. Mm. Uh, I know you've spent a few, uh, a few months um, up, at one of the campuses in like sort of music director role. Mm -hmm. How has, uh, how has that played into your view on worship leading or is that the first time or is that, have you done that before? Mm. And, and how has, how has that affected your view on worship leading and, and how you speak to worship leaders, knowing that you're planning the worship set and stuff like that. Yeah. So I was contracting um, in that music director role with Brownsbridge for a short period. And while I was doing it, I was helping craft the worship sets and such. And that was mm -hmm. not the first time that I've done that, but it's one of the first times that I've had to go and give feedback to my friends. Now mm -hmm. I would say I'm a high communicator. I care a lot about emotionally intelligent communication. I want to yeah. be effective. And I also want to speak to somebody in a moment where they're able to receive it. And so, mm -hmm. you know, being on the other side of that in the SPD side of it, I was definitely more aware of how challenging some of these conversations can be because if I'm standing at the front of house and I'm watching, I'm like, yeah, that feedback from the SPD director or whoever it makes a lot of sense. Whereas if I was standing on stage, I might've felt differently about it. And now I'm thinking mm. I got to go bridge that gap. And I understand how difficult um, feedback can be. And yeah. it helps me to feel more open to the people giving me feedback <laughs> because I understand it's not an easy task to tell somebody hey, maybe not like this, or I mm -hmm. could tell your heart was really in it, but it really just did not translate at all. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's, that's you're challenging. You're trying, but you're trying, nothing. but you're just <laughs> not doing it. You know, that's painful to have to tell somebody, Yeah, but it was, it was helpful information for me, you know? Okay. And yeah, I would say that that feedback was very useful for me. And it's just another layer of realizing we all really are doing our best to do our best. And sometimes oh, yeah. I would hear feedback, not just at Brownsbridge, I've done this at other um, campuses in different arenas okay. as well, but you might hear some feedback that you think, I don't know that I agree with that. And then finding a way to communicate with the worship leader, the heart of what they're trying to say without having to say all of it, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that's the challenge that everyone is trying to figure out, I think, when you're bridging the gap between production and worship leading, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. it's challenging, it's tough. Sure. And What's, sometimes uh, even when your heart is pure, it doesn't come out right and yeah, it's offensive. No, and it hurts people's feelings. True. And you that's gotta true. that's a just once again why you have to cultivate a relationship with these people. It right. cannot it will, just be, yeah. you know, a lot of people will criticize North Point and say it's just a pay to play, you just show up, blah, blah, blah. That's not really true. It is true from a paycheck perspective. Yes, I'm a contracted employee when I'm showing up right. at North Point. But what's not true is that we don't get to know each other. Most of us are contracted regularly at these campuses, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, month in and month out, six months at a time. So we are getting time to get to know each other and we should get to know mm -hmm. each other because the more I know you, Aaron, when you give mm -hmm. me feedback, because Aaron sometimes will run lyrics or he's in charge of people mm -hmm. running lyrics. Sometimes yeah. Aaron will come to me and say, X, Y, Z, sorry, this wasn't there, blah, blah, blah. And I know that Aaron cares about my experience with being able to see those lyrics. So yeah. if I'm having trouble with something or if I need help, I feel absolutely safe to go up to Aaron and say, hey, Aaron, when this song gets to the bridge, could you guys come up a little quicker or, you know, yeah. whatever? Yeah, I don't yeah, think yeah. I've ever said that to you, but like I would be no, you know, no, but... perfectly safe to say that to you if I needed yeah. to, because I know right. you and I know that, you know, I'm not criticizing anybody. I'm in mm -hmm. need and I'm asking you to right. help me. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, yeah. and that's what that's what that's what that's there for right. is for your confidence. Um, right. That's why it's called the confidence monitor. That's right. Um, <laughs> um, in in crafting and being the worship or not the worship uh, music director, can you give us some insight in what goes behind picking this song over that song? Mm -hmm. Why are we singing? Um, you know. Jesus paid it all for the 10,000th time <laughs> yes, or, or right. whatever. Or what? Yeah. Um, that's, yeah. That's a great question. You know, so much of it will have to do with the church or the church campus that you're at and how the lead pastor wants to filter worship sets. So at North Point, we filter, have, what do you, what do you mean filter? 
so at North Point, we've had a model where we go from wide to small as the service right. progresses. You know, mm -hmm. we start out with something that really anybody could engage with, whether they've been in church since they were two days old or whether mm -hmm. this is the first time they've ever walked in and they're 47 years old. We want something that everybody can engage with. So mm -hmm. if I'm crafting a worship set, I'm thinking song number one probably doesn't need to be, you know, Oceans from Hillsong or, you know, something that's going to right, right, like right. take me to a quote unquote deeper place or require mm -hmm. a lot for me. I'll say it like that. Something that's not okay. going to require as much from me right mm -hmm. off the bat. I need okay. time, just like anybody listening to a well-curated playlist to get into the mm -hmm. vibe of it, you know, and we're trying to get hmm. hundreds, sometimes thousands of people, oftentimes thousands mm -hmm. of people to a similar place when their demographic is completely different, their ages are different, sure. their, you know, culture, age, whatever, jobs, all of these things may be different. And we have to try to find a way to open up that funnel and say, everybody get in here. Everybody mm -hmm. get in here. Now, yeah. not everybody has to have the same response or experience with the song. But when yeah. we're crafting worship sets, and again, the lead pastor or the SPD team, they're going to have a big say in kind of what this feels like at your campus. That's been mm -hmm. my experience, but we're crafting something that fits that. And then we're getting narrower and narrower as we go mm -hmm. in. That does mm -hmm. not necessarily mean, and this is a pet peeve of mine. It mm -hmm. does not necessarily mean that the songs have to get slower and sadder. It mm -hmm. just means that the content, in my opinion, mm -hmm needs to get more focused and specific as we go in. You know, mm -hmm. maybe this day we're talking about loss at church. So maybe I'm mm -hmm. going to craft some songs that talk about um, God's understanding of pain or sharing in suffering mm -hmm. with Christ or okay. even something about how much God loves us to remind us that he is good and he loves us and he never leaves us. You know, if I know what the subject is, that's what I'm crafting the set towards. Some people will want you to craft your sets months in advance, and that's totally fine. It's helpful for production. But what mm -hmm. I'm always going to do <laughs> is revisit a week mm -hmm. or two ahead yeah. of time and say, these songs don't match. We're not doing any of this. Sure. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. What's funny is that there were some weeks where we didn't have a lot of time. We were not going to have time for a rehearsal and we had certain key production people who maybe there was a medical emergency and they were gone or mm. were on vacation. And so I've been asked before, we need to do a set list that we have literally done before, like all these songs so that we oh, can okay. kind of from a production standpoint, copy and paste what we have because we're missing key people that yeah. we just this is going to be with the volunteers that we have and where they are in their training level, because you know, sometimes you got seasoned volunteers who know what they're doing, and sometimes, sometimes you got you brand don't. new babies that sure. you're training up. And so yeah. the feedback was where we're at with our volunteers in production, we need a copy and paste situation for this week only. Very rarely does that happen. And again, yeah. this was a campus specific, but we've done that before. And that's a, an example of working together with production on something that I didn't necessarily like the choices that we came up with, but mm. it was to serve the whole purpose the whole team, not just the musicians who just didn't want to do that song for the 8 millionth time right? because right. we don't like it either. <laughs> <laughs> but so that as a whole production, volunteers, band members can all cohesively work together and mm -hmm. be successful. Yeah. A lot of times the reason we're repeating a song um, is because when you're trying to get thousands of people to learn a song and most of them statistically the most recent stats that I've heard, and certainly they could be different, is that they're attending once, maybe twice a month. So yeah, if, if I, mm -hmm. if yeah, if that. And so if I am doing, maybe we've done this same tune a million times, The Battle Belongs, Phil Wickham. We do sure. that a lot at, at Brownsbridge. Mm -hmm. We've done that a lot. Mm -hmm. So you, Aaron, come on the first Sunday of the month, and then you mm -hmm. don't come back again for another month. Well, if you come back and all the songs are different, and then the next time you come, all the songs are different. Mm. You've never had an experience where you came in the door and knew any of the songs we were singing, True. unless you listen to Christian radio, which many people don't. And so <laughs> some of the reason that we repeat so much is so that if you come in, you may not know two of the three songs, but you knew mm. one of them. And so you had a moment where you could engage more mm. fully because you mm -hmm. were familiar with it. And that's the hope there. Yeah. Talk about how much is singability a factor? So this is like oceans or um or um what's the billions song? Oh yeah, I know. Those I was thinking so will I, mean, I. So will I. So, oh so my will word. I. 
not don't not ever singable. ask me to sing that song way too many <laughs> words i cannot be up here doing right. this song. oh my gosh is that a, is that a big thing a uh, singability yeah. um or or it's, does that also depend on on what we're trying to do in the service it's a big thing for most spd teams and this is a place where i tend to have friction and tension because i well, tend okay, to think there's so much more singability to songs than other people do and i defer uh, to the people who aren't singers i'll say that you know i will okay you know, ask people who have no experience with music, like when we're singing this, is this confusing? But I have a little bit of a rub to this because you know what pop singers and classic mm. rock singers and all of them are not asking. I hope this is, is this singable for singable. my fans? And, and, but how many fans get True. out here and sing queen songs, queen songs with 8,000 oh, yeah. harmonies to them, yeah. you know, and they're singing it just right. So I kind of give a little bit of pushback on point. that because I'm like, if the people like the song, they'll learn it yeah. and they'll sing it. Is yeah. it a good song? That's the question I'm asking. Is the <laughs> melody engaging? Not is it yeah. singable, but but not everybody feels that way. And most SPD directors do not agree with me on that. And that's okay mm. with me. You know, I... <laughs> now, is there a difference between singability in uh, singability of the lyrics and then singability in the melody? Yeah, for sure. Because I, Some, I definitely yeah. focus more on melody. Mm, yeah. Um, just, you know, I grew up in band, um, mm. not choir. So I grew up on, in melody. Um, yeah. And so like, if it's a great melody, like I can get into it way yes. faster than if it's like, oh, these are super easy lyrics. If they're super easy lyrics, I'm usually like, did they not try hard? Right. Like, what happened know? in that writing yeah, room? Like, what are you guys doing? But, um, but I, I didn't know if there was a difference between <laughs> those two. There definitely is because okay. to your to your point, so will I. I think mm -hmm. that that song is beautiful melodically, yeah, yeah, like absolutely. from a big picture mm -hmm. standpoint, it's mm -hmm. a beautiful song. Yes. There are so many stinking words in that song. I <laughs> yeah. hate singing it. I mean, the word hate yeah. may be too strong, but probably not. I mean, well, and I hate uh, running the lyrics for it. It's you know? trash. It's not like, the song. Oof. Excuse me. Just to be clear, the song <laughs> is not trash. Having to try to figure out what's next feels like, like trash. Like yeah. I can't do it. My brain won't do it. So yeah. yes, I believe there is absolutely a difference between singability to a lyric and singability to a melody. And there have mm. been occasions where there is a melody that is incredibly challenging, even though I mm. really like it. I will admit that there are times where that's true. I just personally don't feel like it's true as often as I mm. have been told it's true. But okay. I also grew up in a household of musicians. So, you know, yeah, I don't know. That's Maybe true. it's just, I don't know. But yeah, uh, since we're on the sort of subject of worship or um, crafting a worship set, how do you respond to like the, you know, the emotional manipulation sort of argument in like a worship set or even just a church service? I know that that's a uh, a topic now with, well, I mean, maybe it's always been sort of a topic, but just like, oh, the music is meant to emotionally manipulate you. And while I think all music is supposed to do that. Right. That's what well, I think about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, like you mean all music? Okay. There you go. Yeah. I was going to say all music, but then bringing it into the church and yeah. just the people's feelings around that manipulation already. Yeah. I'll um, say, I'll say this. I don't think all music is intended to be manipulative. So, you know, I was joking earlier when I say that. Yes. Right. In some ways I do believe all music is meant to make you feel something. I don't mm -hmm. believe all music is obviously meant to manipulate you. Mm -hmm. I think music can be used as a weapon, even though it's supposed to be a tool, but I don't mm -hmm. think that engaging our emotions with the truth is bad. I think when the scriptures mm -hmm. talk That's about good. worshiping in spirit and in truth, that mm -hmm. that's important. God gave us music as a gift. When we're grieving, what kind of music do we listen mm. to? Most of mm. us need sad music. Why? It elicits an emotional response that we don't know necessarily how to get out of us without it. I mean, the Greeks were doing this way back in the day when they were naming the phrase catharsis. You know, you mm. would go to a show and the hope of the show, why they had all these tragedies and all these big moments were that members of the audience could come and see this thing happening and have an emotional catharsis and experience where they'd mm -hmm. say, me too. And in mm -hmm. doing that, they unlock something that was, was imprisoning them. And so I believe music is God's gift to help us process hard emotions, good moments, joy. It's an expression of joy. Yeah. It's why we dance at weddings. It's why we, you know, get up and love to dance. It's 
it's meant for all those things. And I think if it's applied properly or appropriately is probably a better word with Mm. truth, it's not manipulation. Now, I know what some people are talking Mm. about. Oh, the keys player is playing and they're doing a giving moment and they're just trying to whatever. Well, okay, sure. That has happened. I've also seen people manipulate for that outside of the church. You know, that's not just a church. A dirty yeah. church. I'll say that. That's not just a dirty church tactic. That's mm. that's just a tactic that people use. And if people in a church are using it for that, shame on them. That's not, mm. I, in my belief, what music is for. But if if somebody's asking me if I believe that it's wrong for music and emotion to help them connect with the idea that God loves them mm. or the idea that they're worth something or the idea that they can be forgiven no matter what they've done, great. Like that's Mm -hmm. wonderful. That's a miracle. I love that music can help people hear from God, just like reading the scripture helps us hear from God or talking to somebody who's saying me too can help us hear from God. It's a tool. It can be used as Mm -hmm. a weapon. It shouldn't be. It can, but I'm not going to throw the the baby out with the bathwater. If I'm not worshiping in spirit and in truth, if my emotion's not engaged, I'm disappointed, but I'm not going to fabricate. You know what I'm saying? I'm not going to try to make that up. Um, and there's temptation sometimes to do that, but hmm. you know, that's, that's from a leadership perspective. You know, sometimes you feel yeah. like, well, I can't just be standing out here deadpan in the face while we're singing, you know, whatever, but how do I approach hmm. the song authentically from where I am today? That's the question I'm always asking God and myself. If I'm on hmm. stage and I'm singing something I really am not feeling, mm-hmm. then that's just the conversation I'm having with God the whole time. God, you know that I hate this song. And yeah. I want to honor you right now and I want to lead your people. <laughs> so can you help me figure out where I'm where I'm landing? And that's and that's usually where I come in for me to a place of what I would consider authentic leadership, even with something that I don't mm. necessarily care for. That's 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 really cool, because I think there's there's aspects in production, too, that are like that, too. Like, I mean, like you're loading out you know, after a show and it's like, I don't want to be here. Right. But it's like, well, why am I doing, why am I doing it? Mm. You know, and, and in the church world, um, I know I have to constantly remind myself, like, I don't want to, you know, X, Y, and Z. Right. You know, for the thousandth time, but it's like, (laughs) yes, no, that's, that's the reason I'm doing it. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Or in whatever yeah. situation you're in, it's just like refocusing yourself on this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. Mm. I don't have to like it. Right. Necessarily. Right. I don't, I don't think God tells us that we have to like it, but we are to do the work to honor God. That's right. That's right. And if you really feel that chronically. That might be very unbiblical. I'm not a theologian. I don't think so. I think that if you're <laughs> in an experience, I think there's a discipline to everything good in life. You know, Mm. I don't think that there's anything good in life that does not require a little bit of a grind to it. You know, Mm. as a worship leader, I sometimes have sang the same stinking song Mm. so many times. And there are just times where I would, there are seasons, there have been seasons in my worship leading quote unquote career. I don't know why I put the quotes there. I think it just sometimes (laughs) feels a little weird to tell people I'm a worship leader as a career. But yeah, there have been times in my worship leading career where every Sunday I wake up and the first thing I say is, thank you, God, for my job. Mm -hmm. You and I both know I don't want to go do this, but thank Mm. you that I get to do this and that I'm getting paid to do it. It's not because I don't enjoy worship. It may just be that I've sang that song a million times or I was weary. I don't know anybody that does anything in life that does not have a weariness to it. And that's why I believe God asks us to renew our mind, to Mm. cultivate this sense of joy. It's like tending a garden, you got to get out there and cultivate. And there are Mm -hmm. seasons where you're planting seeds, seasons where things are growing and it's It's not quite there yet and seasons where you're thriving. And I'm not going to say I'm not supposed to be a worship leader or I'm disqualified because there's a grind that I don't like all the time. I don't like Mm, exercising all the time. I don't have to like I tell I'm a personal trainer and I tell my clients all the time. I don't care if you like this. (laughs) You don't have to like it to belong here. You know what I mean? Like you can you can try to cultivate a healthy mindset with it. But some of this sucks and that's okay. Like it's not all glam and that's okay. God didn't say to me, pretend you like all the discipline in this world. The scriptures say no discipline is enjoyed at its Mm -hmm. time, but it produces a healthy crop. Right. That's it. So there are disciplines to our job. It is what it is. (laughs) How have you how have you been able to sort of uh, renew your mind 52 weeks, 52 Sundays in a year for 13 years. 
I don't think I've quite been 13 years in church production. Close, close mm, though. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm pretty um, close. Yeah. How, how have you, how have you found the best way to, to do that? You know, for me and my personality and the way that I experience life and such, I will tend to repeat certain things to myself. For example, in those seasons of dry, I'll wake up and say, thank you, God, this is a gift. Okay. I didn't have this at one time in my life and I desperately wanted it. I'm going to mm. remember that right now. Part of that cultivation is calling to mind when I didn't have what I now have and saying, do I still want that? Was this still a worthy cause? And hmm. nine times out of 10, the answer for me is yes. And I think, wow, imagine if I was still sitting there waiting for this. And if I could see future hmm. Abigail being like, this sucks, you know, whatever. <laughs> I would slap her in the face. Yeah. And I don't shame myself. That's not what I mean. I just remind yeah. myself. It's a way of cultivating gratitude. And other times, the way that I renew my mind is by taking a little break from certain things. Maybe I say okay. no to a couple of things that you know I have the margin to. That's not always possible. But that's just been my experience right. as a contract right. worker, that there might be certain seasons where I'm going to take a break from this or from that. But for the most part, it's been going to God and just being honest about it. God, I'm mm -hmm. not a big fan of this right now. I think you called me to do this. What's mm -hmm. the next step here? I'm stuck. Yeah. You know, there's a, I think it's a proverb that says um, that with my God, I can scale a wall. So if I feel like I'm coming up to this big wall and there's no path, Mm -hmm. I'm looking up and I'm like, well, where's the rope? How are you going to help me scale this wall? Because there's, I can't yeah. turn around. I'm not going back, mm -hmm. but also I don't know how to keep going forward. And God, God always makes a way. He mm -hmm. always refreshes. He always renews, but it's sometimes it's costly. And sometimes it it just takes time, you know, mm -hmm. but to me being honest with God about it, talking to other healthy people about it, especially people who are farther down the road in what I'm doing or who yeah. are shoulder to shoulder with me and Absolutely. saying, do you feel this? What are you guys up to? You know, mm -hmm. I steal yeah. a lot of tactics from other people. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best way to do it. Yeah. That's right. Well, and I think um, reminding yourself of God's faithfulness, that's something my wife and I have been talking about a lot lately. Mm. For me, it's very helpful. Yeah. Well, and just fun to think about that kind of stuff because mm. you're like, that's really cool. Like, you know, you're, X this is real. Year, you're X <laughs> amount of years away from that thing. And you can look mm. back and be like, dang. Yes. I didn't do anything. Literally. I, didn't do anything. I could not have had made like, this happen. Th those things happened and it was not it by anything that I did or didn't do. Right. Um, it was God's protection or protection or provision uh, or whatever provision. There absolutely yeah yes. absolutely and it's just like wow but you don't get those moments unless you take the time to look back that's right you it um, is a discipline it's not going to come naturally for most people hmm. to sit there and remember and that is and that is one of the reasons i believe the scriptures tell us to remember so often in mm -hmm. the Old Testament and the New Testament. Mm -hmm. In the Old Testament, you see a lot of people making physical monuments of things. You know, this big thing happened. Mm -hmm. We're going to build a monument. Why? To remember mm -hmm. that God did this thing. Right. We don't really do stuff like that in our culture. You know, we might really. journal or whatever, but we kind of mm -hmm. like journal, close the book, move on. Mm -hmm. And so I really believe that, you know, God had to instruct us all the time. Remember, remember. And mm -hmm. I think that remembering, and you said that, you know, that you remember, remembering is a part of the renewal, that if mm -hmm. you don't remember what God's done and you don't call to mind the ways or the times that he's come through for you, it can be easy to take for granted. And you will, we all will what mm -hmm. he's given to us. You know, m mm -hmm. I, I am not going to sit here and say, I don't take for granted the gifts God has given me, I absolutely do. Yeah. And the only thing that stops me from doing that is going to God and saying, can you help me see? It's like, David, mm -hmm. search me and know me, God. <laughs> What's offensive down here? Surely a lot. Walk right. me through it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And well, help and, me. <laughs> and and one, something else that's super, it's not always intuitive to people is that because you've remembered God's faithfulness and provision, why would you think that he's not going to continue? Right. But that, I mean, but, but that's the unknown. But we all we're come just, up against We're it. just not, we're not any good at, at, at trusting in the unknown and what's going to happen next. Mm. But you have to. I mean, like, yeah, but I, you, right. you know. Like, right. That's right. Well, I mean, you don't have to. You have a choice. Yeah. You Okay. You don't have to. You don't but have to. it would be helpful <laughs> in your walk with the Lord sure. if you would do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and same thing with worship leading or in production, like knowing that, you know, 
the Sunday's over and we're going to keep moving on. God yeah. will continue to provide like, yeah. uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to roll these cables for this period. And then the, all the cables are going to be rolled. And right. We're done. And then we're going to move on next week. I'll have to roll cables again, but you know, <laughs> that's right. Uh, it's fine. It's whatever, but uh, it's fine. Yeah. It's whatever. It's, it's just the task we hate. It's fine. <laughs> Actually, I, I kind of like rolling cables. Oh, good. Uh, it's a little but, yeah. simple task that keeps you grounded. Just, I guess. Yeah. My cables I love really it. nothing bigger than that. That makes um, sense. <laughs> this has been great, Abigail. Thank you so much for uh, stopping by, and yeah. um, such a pleasure. And uh, good luck with everything uh, moving forward. Thank it's you, Aaron. Thank you. you so much for having me. It was a gift and a joy. And um, thank you for doing this. I think that this conversation between all things church production and all the facets of it is is very important, and and it's helpful. You know, we all feel Mm -hmm. these tensions and stuff. We don't Mm -hmm. all know what to do. And so to hear other people say, oh, raise my hand. Me too. Mm -hmm. Very, very valuable. So I appreciate you doing that. And thanks for having me on. I appreciate that so much. Absolutely. Thank you. Mm -hmm.